Hello again, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. Continuing our series for Christmas, we come today to the Gospel of Luke. We're in chapter 2, and we resume our study in verse number 1. So get your Bible, open it up if you can to Luke chapter 2. We're going to look at the story of the shepherds, among other things. And uh, we'll begin in just a minute. Meanwhile, while you're getting your Bible, I'll tell you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And you can study the Bible in its entirety from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible messages at thebibleversebyverse.com. All you have to do is click on the book you want to study, click on the chapter, open your Bible, follow along, and listen as I teach it verse by verse. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Well, let's pray and get into Luke chapter 2. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Caesar Augustus was the first emperor of Rome. The Roman Senate gave him complete power, which is why he could issue a decree that everyone should be registered and no one had a choice. You had to do it. And so it looked like Augustus had everything that a person could want in this world. And I suppose as an emperor of the most powerful empire in the world, Rome, he did. Complete control. His word was law. But you know what? And he did have a lot. But everything that he had was tinsel. Everything that he had was temporary. He had the temporary applause of temporary people who lived in his temporary empire in this temporary world. And then Caesar Augustus died. And if he didn't have a deathbed conversion that nobody knows about, he went to hell, where he has been for 2,000 years, going on forever. Didn't do him a bit of good. But he's in charge here, at least outwardly. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this registration was first made when Quirinius was governor of Syria. It all went to be registered, everyone into his own city. So, Every Israelite was forced to leave their home and their work and return to the original hometown of their ancestors to register. This was not convenient by any means, but they had no choice because they were ruled by Rome. We are born to bow. We are born, we are created to submit. God warned to Israel way back in Old Testament days that if they did not obey him and submit to him, then they would submit to a foreign country. And that's why they are under the control of Rome right here. They rebelled against God, so they are submitted to Rome. Again, we are born to bow. And if we don't bow to God, then we will bow to sin, and we will bow to man. If we do not serve God, then we will eventually serve sin which will have dominion over us because we are born to bow. 
If we don't submit to the rule of God, then we will submit to the rule of sin, which will enslave us, and we will submit to the rule of man, which will try to control us. Because society cannot exist in anarchy, anarchy, I should say. Anarchy is not an option because God is a God of order. Verse 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. So, in Joseph's case, he had to make an 80-mile journey to Bethlehem in order to register. And I have a feeling that the Israelites were probably saying, we sure wish that God was in control instead of Rome. What they didn't know, probably, is that God was in control. Rome was calling the shots outwardly, but God was in control. He was working behind the scenes. And it is true that the order to go to Bethlehem came from Caesar. But God made it happen for his own purposes. He made it happen to fulfill the scripture which said that his son would be born in Bethlehem. It was inconvenient, but it was God's will. It was inconvenient. The Holy Family might as well get used to being inconvenienced, just like the rest of us, because it happens. Things don't always operate smoothly, do they? But always remember that God is the controlling power behind it all. He has not lost control. And even in the case of a situation like this, with Rome in charge, God was still in control, working his will behind the scenes. You know, as Christians, we may not like those in authority over us. And we might not like what those in authority over us tell us to do. But we should remember that submission to them is submission to God, unless, of course, they tell you to do something that is contrary to Scripture. Then you have to obey God rather than man. But God establishes authority, and we must obey them until such a time as they tell us to do something that contradicts the Word of God. Verse 4, And Joseph also went up from Galilee of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Now, if you are Joseph and Mary, you don't find anything good in this situation, at least not on the surface. Because she is expecting her child any day now. And again, like I said, this is an 80-mile journey. And it was an 80-mile journey during the rainy season for Mary on the back of a donkey. And she's nine months pregnant. So on the surface, it's all bad. I'm not even going to say it appears to be bad. It's bad. Let's face it. Let's not sugarcoat it. It's all bad on the surface. None of it makes sense. But underneath it all, God is fulfilling prophecy. Mary and Joseph are right in the middle of God's perfect will, even though probably none of it makes sense to him or to them. They knew that they were going to be the parents of God's Son. And I'm sure they look forward to that too. But I doubt that they ever expected the road that would get them there would be this difficult. You know how we are. As a rule, 
God tells us to do something, we'll think it's, that, he, that means it's going to be smooth sailing. If we're in the middle of God's will, not so. Especially Joseph and Mary, I would think, you're going to be the parents of God's son. Well, okay, things will probably fall into place nicely. Well, so far they have not. The end result's going to be wonderful, but the road that gets them there, that's a little bumpy, and it begins with this. And our future as Christians is wonderful, too. We're going to have a great reunion with friends and loved ones. We're going to have a brand new body and live on a brand new earth, and it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be great. But the road that gets us from here to there has many potholes and ditches, and a lot of other things that we would rather avoid. Verse 6, And so it was that while they were there, while they were in Bethlehem, they made the journey, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So things just went from bad to worse. And the good news is that they were right in the middle of God's will. The bad news is that when they arrived, there wasn't any, there wasn't any place to be rented, not a room available anywhere. I'm sure it was very difficult for Mary and it had to be very difficult for Joseph too because he loved Mary and he was responsible for Mary and this child and I'm sure he wanted her to be comfortable and the baby is God's son so no doubt he wanted, to, he wanted things to be good for, for Jesus as well and I just wonder sometimes if Joseph thought, where did I go wrong, Lord? Well, I must have really missed you somewhere along the line here. Where did I sway from your path to put us in a situation like this? When did I deviate from your will? I must have missed you somewhere along the line. Or we wouldn't be in this terrible predicament. It's raining, maybe. Mary is 12. She's about ready to give birth. And we don't even have a room to stay in. And we're a long ways from home. Which just goes to show that personal comfort isn't always included in God's perfect will. That's why knowing we are in God's will, because we are not breaking his moral law, has to be enough reward all by itself. It has to be good enough. Verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, a little bit about shepherds. Perhaps you don't know. Shepherds were despised in those days. People didn't like them. People did not trust them. And that's because many of them were thieves and many were liars. They had such a horrible reputation that their testimony was invalid in a court of law. They were not allowed to go into town. They had to stay out in the country. I don't know if there's ever been a people more despised than, than shepherds back in those days. Verse 9, And lo, an angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were very much afraid. Now, notice that God sends this angel to the shepherds. Of all people, the shepherds. God could have sent this angel to announce the birth of his son to anyone. He could have sent this angel to merchants, to business people, 
to the people in the palace, to high society, whatever. He, he, he could have sent this angel to the religious leaders, but he did not. And I suppose conventional wisdom would think that this angel would be sent to someone who the world thinks is important. But God seldom acts according to conventional wisdom. And that's because the values of conventional wisdom rarely line up with God's values found in the Holy Bible. So God sent this angel to the down and dirty, lowly, despised outcasts of society, the shepherds. But I think there was a reason for it. Probably several. Among other things, God was saying, no one is too despised, too uncool, too unpopular, too backwards for me to care about. And that should be our attitude as Christians too. One thing I hate is when I see cliques in churches based on whatever, education, social status, jobs. I can't stand that. I don't think, I don't think God can stand it either. He exalted the lowly shepherds by sending an angel to them. He's sending a message, isn't he? Verse 12. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The first part wasn't unusual. The second part was. Babies were wrapped tight with cloths, but most likely none were ever put in a feeding trough in a barn. But consider this. If the Son of God would have been born in a palace, which is what he deserved, or at least a nice hotel, or in someone's nice house, if he would have born, been born there, the shepherds would not have been allowed to see him. They never would have got past the front door. So Mary and Joseph and Jesus were in a stable. And they were not in that stable because God couldn't figure out how to get them into a nice home. They were in that stable because that's exactly where God wanted them to be. Sometimes God asks us to be inconvenienced. Sometimes he asks us to be uncomfortable for the sake of others. How are you going to communicate Jesus to people in this miserable world who are in miserable circumstances if you aren't in some way involved in the same sort of circumstances. You won't. An ivory tower Christian who has been sheltered, who doesn't know what life is like in the real world, won't get much of a hearing from a miserable sinner who has experienced the pains and the pressures of this life. Verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Can you just imagine this? The shepherds are out in the country it's night. No lights, of course. Probably a sky full of stars. 
the one angel appears. That would have been startling enough, and it was. But then that angel disappears or is accompanied by a whole sky full of angels, and they start singing. Can you imagine being those, those shepherds out in that dark night seeing this? Amazing. God does amazing things. You know, it's, there's nothing better than walking with the Lord. There's nothing more exciting than walking with the Lord. But they say, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Peace on earth is what Jesus brought. Someone says, oh, yes, everyone should get along. Jesus came to earth so that everyone would get along. No, not really. Oh, it would be nice if it were possible, but that's not why Jesus came. He didn't come to bring peace at any price. He didn't come to bring peace between good and evil, between good people and bad people, between truth and error, or between sinners and saints. He did not come to bring that peace. He came to bring peace between us and God by dying on the cross and paying for our sins. And then, you know, as a, as a byproduct of that, if, if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're walking in the Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, walking in the truth of His Word, and somebody else is too, you're not going to have any problem getting along with them. There's going to be peace between you. Verse 15, but he primarily came to bring peace between sinners and God, to reconcile us to God. That's why he came. He was born to die. 15, and it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. So, the angels deliver their message to the shepherds, and then they leave. You know, angels are all business. They appear quite often in Scripture, and they're all business. They don't, they don't mess around with uh, small talk or anything like that. The angels are all about business. They deliver their message to the shepherds, and then they leave. They, they are never seen hanging around after they do their business, after they complete their assignment that God gives them. They don't get into small talk. They are working for God so they don't waste time. They take their role seriously. They delivered their message, and they left. Verse 16. And it says in, in verse 16, it's talking about the shepherds, and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And no doubt, you got to believe that the shepherds told Joseph and Mary about their angelic visit. I mean, how do you keep something like that a secret? And I was thinking what a great encouragement that must have been for Joseph and Mary. Maybe Joseph. Mary was pretty preoccupied. But maybe, I'm thinking, maybe maybe it's because I'm a man. But it must have been a great encouragement for Joseph, for sure. What a great encouragement to him, who all he could provide for his wife and the Son of God was a stable. And probably an encouragement to for both of them. That God was aware of their circumstances and everything was fine. And maybe they even figured out why Jesus was born in a barn when the shepherds show up. Because they know that if, if Jesus would have been born in a house, the shepherds never could have come to visit the king. Unpleasant surroundings and unpleasant circumstances are much easier to handle when you are reminded of God's presence and his approval. Verse 17, and when they had seen it, 
They made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. The shepherds went out and they started telling everybody about what had happened. The angelic visit, the baby Jesus, the Son of God being born in a stable. They went out and they told everybody. And like the shepherds, God has called you and I, as Christians, to be witnesses for Christ. I've heard preachers say that every Christian, I heard one preacher, I should say, say one time, that every Christian should take a class on personal evangelism and how to witness for Jesus. And I'm not saying that's bad, but it can be bad. It can be a bad thing if it becomes a busy work substitute for simply telling people about Jesus. The shepherds never took a class in personal evangelism. They didn't go to the tech, as I heard another preacher say one time. If you want to witness for Jesus, you should go to the Technical Institute and take a class on salesmanship. And he was dead serious. How come these shepherds didn't have to do that? I can't tell you how stupid that is and how worldly-minded something like that is. You can't sell Jesus to anyone. The Holy Spirit is the one who sells Jesus. Witnessing for Christ is very simple. You do what the shepherds did right here, and it doesn't need to be any more complicated than this. They spread the word about what they had been told and what they had seen. Witnessing for Christ means telling people about your experience with Jesus. If you have faith in Jesus and you know he has saved you because of that, then simply tell others who are lost and on the way to hell what Jesus did for you. It doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. Verse 18. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. You know why they wondered? They probably wondered for a lot of reasons. They probably wondered, why would God send angels to the shepherds? since we all hate them. And then to have Jesus born in the barn, the Son of God born in the barn, they wondered at that too. The message of the shepherd kind of fit their profile. Many people probably didn't believe. It's too fantastic. Oh, they're lying again. 19, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. She sure was a thoughtful girl. Mothers usually don't forget about the things that happen concerning their children. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, had many more things to consider than most mothers. 20. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. The people who the shepherds talked to didn't get too excited about Jesus. Not like the shepherds themselves, but they sure were pumped because they... We're right in the middle of it. And there's nothing like being right in the middle of God, right in the middle of the will of God, serving God with whatever gifts he has given you. And we can all do that. So let's rejoice this year, this Christmas season, knowing that this is the reason that Jesus came. This is the reason for Christmas. The birth of Jesus, who came to this planet, was born to die. That's the reason he came. You can continue studying the Word of God if you want to at thebibleversebyverse.com. Study the book, study the Bible in any order you want, from Genesis through Revelation or in any other order. Any book of the Bible, any chapter of the Bible, just click study, open your Bible, listen, and follow along as I teach it verse by verse. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Please make use of this. God wants you to be in the Word. And if the Word of God is a blessing to you, I would appreciate it if you would remember that we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support. And you can be a part of this ministry. You can be a part of this ministry by praying and by giving. I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. For 30 years, this has been a faith ministry, which simply means that I depend on individuals who love God's Word and want to be a part of helping me get out the word to more and more people. 
and just click on the donate button and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. That's at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. But whatever you do, whatever you do, study the Word of God, okay? Bible says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Study the word this Christmas season and have a Merry Christmas. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.